You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagoya Dillin and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Body Banter. My name is Claudia Krebs, and I'm joining you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation, currently occupied by UBC here on the gorgeous Point Grey campus. And with me, of course, is Shagan Oyedeli. Hello, everyone. Shagan Oyedeli again with you today on this episode of Body Banter, and I'm here in Kelowna in the traditional, unceded, and ancestral territories of the Silks Okanagan Nations. And today I'm really, really proud and happy to uh, introduce to you, or perhaps let our guest introduce herself. Melissa, would you go ahead and introduce yourself? Absolutely. My name is Melissa Carroll. I'm an associate professor at the George Washington University um, in Washington, D.C. So I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Melissa, it's so nice to have you on the podcast. I remember the first time I met you was at a meeting of the American Association for Anatomy, and you were presenting a poster on pelvic anatomy, and I made a beeline for you, and I'm like, oh my God, we got to work together. This sounds amazing, and um, I'm so glad that we um, we met and um, have been sort of in touch ever since. Absolutely. So you're an anatomist. Um, how did you get to be an anatomist? What's your journey? Yeah, so um, I guess I often describe myself as a classically trained anatomist, which means that I do, well, I was trained in gross anatomy and microanatomy. So I did take some histology. I have not done it since I was a grad student. So maybe that makes me fall off of the classical anatomist train. Um, But then of course, embryology and neuroanatomy. So it was interesting because I was a senior in college and I was able to take a graduate level dissection course at Colorado State University. So we had to apply to kind of get in it. Um, And it was really interesting because CSU is, uh, or at the time was a big vet school. So there was a huge veterinary dissection lab and the human dissectors were kind of in this offshoot lab, very small. We only had a few, um, you know, body donors that we were working with. And it was, just, I always remember um, as the human dissectors would come out, we would be kind of grossed out by the vet dissectors and they would be grossed out by us. And so it was a, such an interesting experience when I was a senior that I decided to um, apply to get my master's in anatomy. Both of my parents actually are medical doctors. Um, So I was born and raised in the Bahamas. So my dad's Bahamian and my mom's Trinidadian. And so they met in Jamaica at medical school. And so in that process, you know, growing up, I always thought I was going to be a medical doctor. So I decided to take the, the, the transition to get my master's and then apply for medical school. While I was getting my master's, it was required of me to teach in the medical program for my second year of the master's. And I fell in love with that teaching. Um, You know, interestingly enough, I traded with some students um, anatomy knowledge if they taught me how to drink beer because I didn't like the taste of beer, but I was on my way to Belgium. So I was like, I can't go to Belgium and not like beer. So it was quite an interesting um, trade. And then in that process, I realized how much I enjoyed this teaching teaching capacity. So um, at the time, you still only had maybe two times a year that you could take the MCATs. And so they were always scheduled for a Saturday. And the Thursday before I was scheduled to take the MCATs, I was like, I do not want to be a medical doctor. I want to stay teaching. Um, And so I actually did not go and take the MCATs. I actually transitioned to apply for my PhD. And I continued on with that journey. So that's my circuitous way of getting into anatomy. That sounds very interesting, Melissa. And, <laughs> and, and as someone who started out as a medical doctor and now is um, teaching anatomy full time, I can understand circuitous journeys. <laughs> and because I, mine was something similar uh, in the, perhaps in the opposite direction uh, <laughs> to what you've described. 
Um, and and so what do you, in terms of kind of your day-to-day job, so what what actually do you teach? Do you teach, uh, you've mentioned histology, neuroanatomy, or do you teach all of those subjects? Yeah, so once I graduated with my PhD, I actually um, had a choice to teach at an undergrad level, uh, medical school, or go into um, one of the other healthcare professions. And in that process, I chose to um, go into other healthcare professions because I, I, I at the time felt that it was underserved and that I could actually learn a lot because I didn't have that exposure. So I started teaching in physical therapy curricula, as well as occupational therapy, speech and language pathology, um, biomedical engineering, Um, And so in that process, I was really focused in on embryology, neuroanatomy, and anatomy. So histology wasn't as important um, in in the curricula that I was teaching. So I think that's where my histology training kind of fell to the wayside. Um, And I focused more in on anatomy um, with gross dissection and neuroanatomy. And so then for the last seven years before I took this job, I was just primarily in a PT program. And then my last year there, I started getting back into medical curricula. Um, And then I've now been at GW for about a year. So um, I'm actually teaching um, graduate students, neuroanatomy and undergraduate neuroscience majors, neuroanatomy, um, neuroscience in the medical curriculum, and then helping out in our um, dissection lab, prosection lab, whenever is necessary. So I still do primarily, I would say, anatomy and neuroanatomy. That's so cool. I love that you teach so many different cohorts of students. Um, and I mean, I um, have a similar experience here in that I teach neuroanatomy to diverse health professions, medical students, and we'll be starting to teach an undergraduate course uh, in neuroanatomy next year, I think. Um, so you teach a lot of neuroanatomy. What do you love about neuroanatomy? Because I feel like you can't teach it without loving it. So tell us more about that. That's true. Um, So I think for me, I love the challenge of neuroanatomy. So anatomy, gross anatomy itself, just discovering the body was, I feel like if you can touch it, it makes sense. You can trace it. You can understand that, you know, this structure connects with this structure, that physiology piece really helps to kind of put the body together. But with neuro, I felt like I'd finally gotten into, especially when I was a graduate student, I got into a a subject that was very curious to me and also challenged me to think outside of the box. Um, And, you know, the way that we had always taught it with our PT students is we said, if you understand gross anatomy, you might struggle when you're starting to learn about neuroanatomy because gross is very... um, it, it, it could be very straightforward where neuroanatomy is much more abstract. Like you have to really pause, think, reflect, and understand that we don't know all the answers yet. And I think that in itself is also really interesting that you can start getting yourself in a spiral of trying to figure out, okay, well, when I go to reach for something, what's really happening first? You know, am I cognitively aware that I'm reaching? Then am I making out my motor plan? Am I firing my, you know, my skeletal muscles at the same time? You know, and when you start getting yourself all wrapped up in that, um, it's so amazing to think that 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 fleshy, gooey substance is really controlling everything when you start thinking about the central nervous system and then that, you know, powering out to the peripheral, And then let's not even talk about the autonomics, because when I was a graduate student, that literally, in my opinion, wasn't well taught to me. So it took me years to just constantly trace it out, try to understand it, to really to appreciate what the autonomics were doing. And I wouldn't say that I, I, I feel like I'm an expert. I say that very loosely. That's why I said it so slow in trying to help people learn the autonomics Although I wouldn't say that I completely, again, still understand this nebulous structure um, that's happening in respect to the um, neuroanatomy. So I think that we're also on the precipice of learning so much more once you start thinking about the uh, 
the DTI, like all the imaging stuff that's coming out that we're tracing some of the pathways. So it's really, I think it's just a cool subject on how everything com- com- comes together. Oh yeah, you, of course. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's my, my area. Absolutely. <laughs> so you mentioned um, the difficulty students have in dealing with uncertainty. Um, and we, we have that in all of our health professional students. And I think many of our undergrads and grad students as well, they, they want certainty, they want facts, uh, they want something that they can uh, sort of memorize and keep as this gem of knowledge for life. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't work in your anatomy. And it's often like the first exposure that they have for a whole subject area that is uncertain. How do you balance the student's uncertainty and your own uncertainty that you've just described? So you say you're an expert on teaching the autonomic nervous system, and yet you have so many uncertainties around that. How do you do it? Yeah, um, that's a really great question. I think, at least for me, The more that I learn about something, the more that I realize I don't know about it. Um, And I think that is a healthy place to be. Um, One of my colleagues and I actually finished a study on um, imposter phenomenon and a tolerance to ambiguity. And I think that's really what you're capturing in respect to where we are as as when we're students, even when we're junior faculty or novice in our field. And I would say, you know, we when we get to a level that we can feel a little bit as calling ourselves an expert. And I always hesitate to get to that point. I think we're combated with that. Am I really an imposter if I say that I know this because I recognize how much I don't know? And am I just also identifying that I'm an expert because I'm comfortable in the fact that I don't know certain things. I'm comfortable in that place of ambiguity. I think that's the biggest thing for students when they can get there and be comfortable with saying, I don't know that yet but I can see how A connects to B. Um, And once I feel confident in this foundation, maybe I can build on that block of of how C comes into play. Um, That is really, for me, in dealing with neuroanatomy, I feel like one of the first classes or the first few classes often is let's build a foundation and recognize that you're going to learn this in isolation. There is no way that we can tackle the higher complexities of cortical functioning without first understanding how a neuron functions and then how we can build up that they're ascending and descending pathways. There's there's just no way to, to jump right to the end of the book. And I think that if we're comfortable in recognizing that neuro has to be taught in a silo and you have to understand that um, typical function, then you can somewhat feel a little more confident in recognizing um, where we get atypical function. So once we're starting to get into any type of neuropathology, and we can also start appreciating the complexity of what we do know, at least within the field of neuroscience right now. Um, And feeling comfortable with being uncomfortable, I think is really that threshold concept. That's really where I think you start understanding there's so much more to know, but we can at least tackle this small section of what we do know right now. That's so profound, um, Melissa. And and I I, I feel that because I it's almost the place where we as professors and as um, experts, like you said, that's it's the place we live daily because we are always uh, very, we know that much and we're confident that this is what we know um but that's just beginning to scratch the surface and and students would challenge us on that they would ask questions that say mm, you know i haven't thought of that <laughs> you know and, and, and so if your students expect you to to provide all the answers they would come away disappointed because you will not be able to give them all the answers and i think that's actually what learning is about to actually then f- go out and find out and make those discoveries yourself. And if, if no one has discovered it yet, well, perhaps there's, they, they have a roadmap, perhaps they, perhaps they have an approach that you can learn from. And I think that's actually, that's actually, I, I believe the pinnacle of learning where you we say, okay, this is where what we know so far lies this is where it the, the brings us to this point and then so how do we go from here to the next how do we make the next leap and, and i think that's where you now begin to create new knowledge 
and begin to synthesize information from all the different sources. So it's it's really amazing um, the way you've described it. I like that concept of being comfortable with be of be, with being comfortable with the discomfort. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's it's really amazing. Now maybe to transition into another area of perhaps discomfort or comfort, depending on what you how you'd see it. And this is about your work with black in anatomy you know yeah. um and i know i mean given i follow the news i follow the u.s to my chagrin u.s politics i follow all the different you know sides and um and push and pull of it all and and the black in anatomy actually sits in a really i would say historic place right now given all that's going on in a broader society and and do you mind telling us about how that started and 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 some of the things that you want to you hope to achieve by uh, by bringing together um, uh, the, or starting that movement of, of black in anatomy? Yeah, so you know, I honestly I'm really blessed to have um, found individuals that were interested in working in a collective goal. Um, for me, again, being born and raised in the Bahamas and being born to um, parents that were great models to me about how to become a professional. And in a society where literally um, I looked around and everybody that I saw looked like me. So, you know, even though the Bahamas is a very diverse country, I never felt isolated because I was black. Um, And so when I came to the States, I know that I was always being prepared by my parents, by my grandparents for the potential discrimination that I was going to feel. Um, I think that as a black professional, um, and this is regardless of where you might be trained, especially I would say, at least in North America, um, when you recognize that the higher you go in your profession, the more likely you might be the only person that looks like you within the classroom, you really have to have uh, confidence in who you are um, and what your moral foundation is. Um, And I also had a great support team so that whenever I felt like I was um, a little low, I was able to call my parents and get kind of that reinforcement because they had been there before. I was also able to create a really great support system of other Black professionals that were able to feed into me. So in the process of everything that happened in 2020 um, and just feeling almost in a place of being defeated, feeling that I was serving so many students that that a minority of the students looked like me and I was serving the majority and I wanted to make sure that I was feeding into people that were coming behind me, meaning that individuals that might've had a similar journey. Maybe I wanted to go to medical school, but I decided to go into anatomy. Maybe I decided to go into another uh, related anatomical field, but I can't see within my profession individuals that look like me. Um, And so for me, I wanted to make sure that I had recognized I'd come across so many instrumental people that could be great mentors, but we didn't have a network to be together. Um, And so it really, at first, was just an outlet for individuals to come together to talk, to feel safe in their skin and get that support back. Um, I've worked with some amazing collaborators, um, the founding members that have come in as well. Um, So Allison Nesbitt, and Sean McWatt um, have been instrumental. They're also on the board right now. Um, And then we have some other members and especially um, our creative director, um, Naomi Robeson, who actually trained at University of Toronto. So, you know, we have a great connection of um, not only American, if you will, but also Canadian representation to have this development of a safe space. We also have graduate students that came in and helped. Um, So Kristen McPike, um, that was at Howard University and really tried to see what can we service for not only junior level faculty, graduate students, can we make an attractive um, place for people to stop? Um, Meaning like a website, social media design, can we just increase and amplify the knowledge of the black 
contributions that have been made to anatomical sciences. Because I think that was the hardest thing. Like, yes, there's a fight against eponyms right now and, you know, changing some of the terminology that we're using. But what was most, I wouldn't say most discouraging, but it was a little discouraging is that when you look at the history of academic medicine, you see a lot of and I apologize for using this phrase, but you see a lot of white male faces and you just don't see much of anything else. And I knew that that had to be a fallacy. I knew that there was more that people have contributed and we just don't know about it. Um, and so that's really where Black and Anatomy, I think, has been starting to make at least an impact in recognizing that it's not just for um, Black contributions to be highlighted, but what's happening with Middle Eastern contributions, what's happening with um, Latino contributions, like where are all of these pockets of individuals that can be proud in what their heritage has contributed to a science that they might love. So we're really proud that we've gotten this um, development now um, that we are actually recognized as a nonprofit organization um, in the U.S. And so we're restructuring and hoping to recruit more members, um, allow members to direct where we go, the building of resources. So we're really excited about um, the potential. And to your point, yes, we're sitting at the precipice of a really historic moment of what we can push forward in recognizing that there is so much more to anatomy and the history of anatomy that we know right now. Thank you so much, Melissa. And, and um, I recognize that story. I recognize that journey very, very well because I, um, you said it, that as a Black person, the, the higher you go in your profession, the more you feel isolated uh, and you become like just you don't see people that look like you and um and but maybe on the other side which you also alluded to you find that you attract junior faculty and junior um maybe residents sometimes or or postgrad students or undergrad students who recognize you and as someone, oh, this person looks like me oh, for the first time. You wouldn't know how many times I've been stopped here on campus by somebody said, are you here? Where yeah. are you? <laughs> Where are you? I've been looking for someone like you. Um, and so that's, that's for me, that's comforting and that I can be a role model and I can um, give back um, to people coming, uh, upcoming, the next generation of academics and of students and professionals. So that's, that's really good. And I, and I congrat again, congratulations for becoming a nonprofit in the U S and, and I really look forward to, and I'm sure all of us, I speak for Claudia as well, look forward to collaborating, uh, in any way we can, uh, with, with Black in Anatomy. Yes. Um, maybe shifting gears a little bit and then um, we like to ask people on the podcast about their favorites, <laughs> their favorites in anatomy. Now you've been in anatomy for quite a while, and, and I'm sure you've you've had many candidate favorites along the way. <laughs> and so I'm wondering, have you settled on a favorite anatomical structure or not part of anatomy or part of the body? What is your favorite anatomy uh, anatomical part? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a great question. I know you even primed me about it and I was thinking about it um, and I think it's changed over the years. You know, when I was a when I was a graduate student, I thought that the abdomen just made complete sense. You know, you, you can you literally can follow the entire tube. And I thought it was the, the coolest thing ever. Um, I did my dissertation research on Crohn's disease and, um, you know, the imbalance of stat proteins and macrophages. So I had to do a lot of husbandry with transgenic mice and uh, I, I dealt a lot with the GI. So I think that that my my favorite as a graduate student then became my least favorite as uh, as I transitioned past that as well. Um, so much so that now, especially when we would open the abdomen, um, I would just you know, you, you get some surprises sometimes. So I would let my students know I'm here to support you, but I don't want to take that experience away, which basically transitioned to um, you're on your own when it comes to poop. Like, I'm sorry, that's the only way that I could say it. And um, in that process, I think that it's, it's, for me, the joy really when it comes down to anatomy, like actual gross anatomy is to see 
my students finally get those light bulb moments. So I don't know if there's a favorite. I think I think really my favorite is that watching the students' faces when it finally clicks. And that could come from any particular region. Um, I think some students really get excited to see the heart, but it's really when they, they get other areas when they're just like, oh my gosh, I have read about this. I couldn't figure this out. I couldn't understand the 3D. Now, finally, when my hand is here, when I see this, that light bulb moment, I think is my favorite thing when it comes down to anatomy. Melissa, when you're speaking like this, I see the generosity that you have for your students and how much you value them and their journey. Um, when we ask you about your favorite body part, you your response was basically whatever my students are most fascinated by. Yes. Put yourself back into when you were a student and you said it was the GI tract because that's what you were working on. But what is that moment when you were like doing a dissection or doing some reading and you were just and the light bulbs all went on and you were like, whoa. Yeah. Um, so for me, I think it goes back to the autonomic nervous system, like for the process that I struggled to try to understand. Um, and I, I remember this the first year that it was taught, I was like, what are they talking about? What are what are these things called splanchnics? Which coolest word to say, but so difficult to comprehend. Um, and so then when I did more and more dissections, when I was able to actually trace out the sympathetic trunk and really have an opportunity to, to see those splanchnics travel and um, see how the actual um, plexuses were developed developing, those were moments where it was just like, oh my gosh, this makes so much more sense. Oh, I can see the actual, um, the gray ray communicons or the white gray ray communicons and how this whole network works, you know? So I think that that, that connection between, um, again, a very complex 3D moment, as well as more abstract in recognizing how is this functioning and then being able to appreciate, you know, I, I remember some of the really dumb moments that I had, and I try and tell my students about that as well. Like, okay, the spinal cord ends around L2, uh, L1, L2, but where then the, the actual sacral and coccygeal segments? Oh, well, it's not that they're related to the vertebra. It's the fact that those segments are actually smaller than you think with the nice you know, ventral roots and dorsal roots as they come out as this conus medullaris into the cauda equina. You know, so those big moments where it was just like, okay, I see the structure, but I still don't recognize its function. For myself as well, I think that's why I have so much passion for when my students get those moments, because I remember those really like, oh my gosh, Melissa, like seriously, why did it take you that long to understand that one small thing? But when that light bulb goes on, when that key finally turns the lock, it opens so many other possibilities. And I think that's why it's, it's, it must be like, I don't know, nervous system for me, I guess. Beautiful. And what you just said resonates so strongly with me, like the area that we fought the hardest to understand that was so inaccessible to us when we initially, you know, we're told you've got to teach this, um, turns out to be our favorite. Mm -hmm. I have a similar thing. So my favorite part of the brain is the cerebellum, not because I fully understand it, because I don't think anybody fully understands it, <laughs> but because <clears throat> I had to work so hard to um to wrap my head around it and to um understand the circuits and then pare them down and down and down until i had this you know reduction into something into one diagram that would be accessible for students and um and so i love teaching it now but i have to say i i started out thoroughly terrified and in a lot of respect for for that area that's how I felt about teaching the basal ganglia. I oh, same. It, yes. <laughs> I turned it into a dodgeball situation in the classroom. And that is, that's, it's, it's hilarious to watch, but also all the light bulbs start to come on too. Yeah, absolutely. Those two together are my favorite. Yeah. Because I worked the hardest to, um, to create a framework. That connection. Absolutely. Yeah. So What's your least favorite body part? 
I think it's the poop. <laughs> I think, you know, it's, I, was, I know, I'm sorry. It's just one of those things where it's like, you know, as much as I enjoyed that process when I was a graduate student, I, that's why I say like, you know, you never forget that. And I just want, I, I, I don't mind that process of helping and Hey, let's, do a hemisection of the pelvis because the pelvis is, is so complicated and so fascinating, but that, that process in respect to the dissection in respect to just, you know, cleaning things out. I, I think I, over the amount of years that I've done this, I I feel like I want to save that journey for the students. (laughs) Oh my word. That's so that's a nice way to put it. <laughs> Guys, you're on your own. Exactly. On this fascinating. <laughs> All of my students knew, like I would be on the other side. I would point, I would help, but you know, that journey is all yours. And I think that's fair, right? It's one journey for them. It's an every year's journey for you. So I think that makes sense. And I think many anatomists um, who dissected for many years will have a lot of empathy for that statement. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That's wonderful. I love how you center the student, how you center the learning and how you center the human, the human body. And it really permeates your entire body of work. Um, And, you know, your founding of Black in Anatomy was really centering all humans because it is still in that sort of Eurocentric uh, worldview. And um, as educators, as academics, our job is to create knowledge and distribute knowledge. And when we just recycle um, stale knowledge and stale frameworks, um, we're doing a real disservice to our students who are diverse and who increasingly, um, and rightfully so, demand more diversity and demand us to be on our A-game when it comes to that. And I think your contributions to that are a real gift to the entire community. So um, thank you so much for being awesome. I really appreciate that. And it would be remiss of me to say I do not do it alone. Um, Again, we have such an amazing team that has really carried a lot of that load. Um, So, you know, Shout out to the entire Black Anatomy team. They've done phenomenally. Wonderful. Go ahead, Shagan. No, it's just, I'm sure uh, we've done this so many times, Claudia and I, that I'm sure we are probably uh, thinking along the same lines to to, to thank you, Melissa, again, for for all that you've uh, contributed to anatomy specifically, and then to Black Anatomy more recently. And you're right. Um, I think I met um, Alison um, in the last at uh, the last AAA meeting, and uh, you know, she was very quick to hand me the flyer and the application form. <laughs> 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 so that's uh, that's really cool. And uh, yeah, so thank you. Um, over to you, Claudia. Well, thanks again, Melissa. I think we could be here for another hour and just talk about all the things and all of our experiences. Um, Thank you for sharing um, this view into your life and your view onto the body and your contributions with us and all the listeners. Um, Thanks for taking the time out of your busy life to be with us. Thanks so much. Thank you. And that wraps up another episode of Body Banter. And uh, we look forward to sharing the airwaves with you next time. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time. <laughs>